On this episode of the Gene and Dave Show, we join CTD staff as well as guest host RJ Mitty, co-star of Breaking Bad. This year, CTD presented Cinema Touching Disability with an additional segment on accessible fashion for people with disabilities. The following program may contain strong language and brief duty. But don't get your hopes up. After all, this is Public Access TV. I'm Gene. And I'm Dave. And we're the Gene and Dave, Dave Show. Show. Gene, man, it is fall, October in Austin, and I tell you what, I am excited. Yeah, what are you excited about, Dave? The, the fall weather, the, the leaves changing? No, no, no. no and I, I, I like the warm weather, so it's not, not really the weather. Oh, it's Halloween coming up. You're getting ready for Halloween. Yeah, right? well, I, you know, I'm a little too old for trick-or-treating, so that's not really my thing either. Well, what about the, the holidays? Thanksgiving yeah. coming up? Christmas? Yeah, I mean, that's all excited. I mean, I get to eat. But I tell you what, Gene, I'm really excited because fall in Austin means that it's time for the Cinema Touching Disabilities Film Festival, oh, yeah. which is fantastic. It's put on uh, by CTD, Coalitions for Texans with Disabilities, and we've got Will here today probably to tell us a little bit more about that and what's going on with the film festival, and I couldn't be more excited. But what I'm really excited about this year is definitely meeting RJ Mitty. Very nice pleasure, to meet you, man. man. Thanks, Thanks for pleasure. being on here. And if you you probably recognize him from Breaking Bad. Maybe. Uh, maybe. <laughs> you were junior. Yes, on yes. Breaking I did. Bad. And that, I tell you what, when I saw that, when I I've watched every episode probably at least two or three times, you know. That's what we like. watched, yeah. Netflix, all of that. Um, but I saw that and I was really uh, inspired. Or at least, you know, I was like, this is really great. This is somebody that's really got, that really has cerebral palsy and is, is in the role. And we see that a lot in films where, you know, they hire actors to play people with disabilities. Yes. And, um, well, you know, you're an actor with a disability, and uh, I think it was, was great. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was very lucky to, to get the opportunity to portray that role and to, to play a character that... that me and the character had so much in common, um, sharing very intimate experiences in, in my life and in, and in so many people's lives that, that experience um, just life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I remember seeing you, um, you, you um, also, you're a big philanthropist. I do my best. You do a lot of stuff for nonprofits and helping out the little guy. And I saw you give a speech, yeah, a yeah. keynote speech, and you came out on stage and you were walking and you didn't have your crutches. And I'm like, what is the deal? You know, I thought this guy really had a disability, yeah. um, you know, in this role. But you really, you just, you strapped on the crutches for the role, for Correct. the character, right? Well, so Walt Jr., Walt Jr. is actually based on a real person. Uh, a friend of Vince has been in college who um, sometime after passed away. Uh, but Walt Jr. was kind of created in memory of this guy, oh. and um, he he had cerebral palsy and he used um, forearm crutches, and I I never really used crutches unless I, I, I broke a bone or, or something like that. But um, I had AFOs, um, leg mobilizers. Uh, I was I was diagnosed at three. Um, for me, I never really. Um, and I always, I always did my therapies on time. Yeah. So I was, I was a good, I was a good little, little whipping boy of, of, of run and make sure you do that, so you can do something else. So do you have to sit on that little ball and have your balance. The ball. Well, for me, for me, it wasn't so much the ball as it was, um, just finding um, my, my spasticity. Okay. So, so yeah. I, I, having cerebral palsy, for people that don't know, um, cerebral palsy um, is caused from numerous things and usually people that have CP have multiple disabilities on top of cerebral palsy. But, um, but it is from lack of oxygen to the brain at childbirth or, or within the first stages of, of child development and uh, which portions of the brain just never received oxygen. So that causes anything from hand-eye coordination to, to speech, dexterity, spasticity. Um, for me, it was my left side. Uh, I would contract on my left. I still normally contract on my left. And, uh, and through years of just being like dough, 
and just pulled apart mm. and put back together and um, just maintain maintain that. They they gave me crutches when I was a kid, mm -hmm. um, but my family was like, you're not going to use them. Because um, my, my aunt Kitty had polio, my grandfather uh, had strokes, we, we, we've always had stuff in the medical field with our family. So we learned and we've seen at a very young age, the, the earlier you give someone aid, the less likely they're not going to rely on it. Right. And um, they're like, nope, you're going to walk, you're going to walk without it, and if not, you're going to crawl till you walk. <laughs> and, um, and that's what I did. Kind of forced you into it then. Forced me into it and very thankful for that. And, and through Shriners Hospitals for Children, I uh, was able to, to really home myself and, and really with, with Walt Jr. was an eye-opener. was one of those things that, that was like, this, this really would have been me without tools, mm -hmm. without, without, without having the proper guidance, without having yeah. people that, that really wanted me to, to make the best of who I am and, and what I am. I, I would probably actually use crutches right now. I'd probably still be in, in, in snafos and braces and and um, and not able to maintain my own level. You know, the, it's really having a, a physical disability and, and even mental disabilities as well is maintaining, maintaining, maintaining that that line of like. So do you still do physical therapy? I stuff? I do everything. Yeah. I I just I have though incorporated it into my daily life. So it's a habit. So it's a habit. Yeah. Okay. I don't even I don't even think about it. It, it, it becomes second nature to to do it. And like I'll I'll stretch throughout the whole day, but you won't even know that I'm stretching. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how cerebral palsy affects everybody different. I have mm -hmm. cerebral palsy too. Um, you know, and I have I need to use a wheelchair to get around, but. Yeah, I never let it stop me, and Gene's never let um, his paralysis stop him either. So, I mean, I think when people get stopped, and, and everyone has their own reasons what limits them, but I don't find it's from whatever is affecting them. I don't find I don't I don't really find it. it it's the disability per se. I, I find it's, it's the environment that that puts people in boxes. And if you're willing to learn to fight that box, tooth and nail, mm -hmm. you can do it. You can get out and you can live that. But, but people sometimes have a hard time seeing that. Yeah. If they learn to adapt to it, learning to adapt to different situations, yeah. um, they're less and less disabled, yeah. I think. I agree. So and you're, you're a big supporter for um, people with disabilities that are actors. Correct. As I am, yeah. Um, yeah. I've done a few uh, films here in Austin, and of course this TV show that we're on right now. Um, but you, you're in the SAG-AFTA, right? Yeah, after, you're, yeah. You're on the board for the the for, disability community. So, so uh, yes, it is. I sit on the board for SAG-AFTA. Um, uh, I am PWD committee. It's a, I am a performer with disability. Um, we focus on, on raising awareness in the arts and media of putting performers with disabilities in the forefront of the screen and the importance of having um, disability in, in major network and in mass media. Um, and then that goes everything from, from behind the camera to in front of the camera to, to legislation and, and lobbying to, to advocacy on, on many fronts. Um, but really, it's building a community, and I think that's one of the things that, that we, we, we're all very lucky is that, that we have our communities and, and that we, we grow them further and that we continue to use those strengths. And that's what, uh, that's what we really are, are working on doing is just strengthening our community and working together and getting that forefront. Cause that, and, and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm working with, with CTD is because they're doing that and, mm -hmm. and they're bringing that disability highlight to, to the to the screen and, and advocacy and showing what 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 people do and, and how they do it and really awareness is key so yeah so and you're here hosting I am weekend, I'm host the CTD the cinema touching disability film festival William how long have you guys been doing this this is like a new thing right this is like your second year <laughs> was a very good beginning, but it's gotten bigger and bigger as years went on. You know, we started off 
showing good disability films. Then a few years later, we included a short film competition. Mm -hmm. Now we accept entries from all over the world. And how many entries did you get this year? About 131. Wow. 130 or so. And they all have to be screened, huh? We showed the winners. Uh, we're but not you had to watch it. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah he, he saw them. <laughs> no, the, the, team, the team sees them. It's, it's funny though, because I, I noticed he said the first year we showed the good one. And then we opened the short ones. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, it's, it's true. But it's so amazing though, as, as you know, to see all the art that comes from it. Because you, people don't realize that people are making films every day. And they just never see the light of day. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really nice to work with groups that, that bring it to light. And you know, the, we are showing some really good outstanding films. Um, there are still films with bad and really negative disability messages being put right, out. Right. And you know, you had one high school girl, you have uh, someone who's older and a professional doing this, and we just see it all over the place. Yeah, and so this year, uh, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but this year you're really focused on fashion. Right, a lot of the, the films, and you've got a fashion panel, and We've RJ got, is also a, a model, right? He's, yeah, um, I, I model a little. Yeah? We've got a couple of things. Tonight we're showing, uh, our feature is about uh, blind photographers. And uh, it was based on someone who said, oh, blind photographers? That's crazy. Someone who's blind can't take a picture. Then he started looking into it and said, I'm so wrong about this. Wow. Okay. There's actually some really incredible photography uh, by people who are visually impaired or totally blind. And the really big thing we're doing tomorrow night is our fashion show. It's adaptive fashion. Um, we're showing some shorts from Runway of Dreams, which creates adaptive fashion that can be bought off the rack. Mm. And um, you can buy Nike, Tommy Hilfiger, mm -hmm. and Target or something. Yeah, there, there's a couple. Um, so, so Runway Dreams is actually working with Zappos Adaptive. So Zappos um, is one of the affiliates, um, uh, is an online shopping store. And Runway Dreams is partnered with them in getting people uh, that create adaptive clothing uh, out into the mainstream markets. And, and I, I've done some work with, with Runway of Dreams and that was adaptive. And I, I just actually was doing uh, some stuff in Vegas for them as well. And it's amazing to see, because for the longest time, I mean, I think we're all kind of from the South. Everyone had a grandmother that was a seamstress. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Every, everyone, everyone had that, that, oh, don't worry, I'll take it in or I'll make it fit or I'll do that. And, and for a lot of people that, that need adaptive clothing, that's kind of been, that's the way. There's only one option is, is you find something you, you kind of like, that's oversized, and you, and you get it to, to make it work. And what's amazing to see is these lines pulling together and, and saying like, hey, we're here. And, and it goes back to awareness that, that there are these organizations that are creating adaptive clothing and that you don't have to go spin an arm and a leg or, or have your shoes ripped apart or your pants ripped apart to, to, to get, to dress yourself. So let me, let me ask about adaptive clothing. I yeah. want to know more about that and what it is, but I'm going to put the question to you. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about what adaptive clothing is? Yes, um, so I have polio and I've had it since I was uh, three or four in Vietnam and um, so I grew up with the, my disability. Uh, I've never known anything else. Um, so when I was growing up uh, I would have to, you know, struggle to uh, dress myself. Uh, my mom would help me but um, I was independent and um, so adaptive fashion is trying to adapt to like I guess normal clothing Okay. Uh, where it won't be so uncomfortable, or look, won't look, um, I guess, ridiculous. Um, and it just makes you feel more confident to be more comfortable in your own clothes. Right. Um, and I'm so glad. I've never even heard of 
um, adapting, you know, clothes to a, a particular disability um, until uh, William had, um, you know, suggested the idea. So, um, and I didn't know about Zappo shoes. And uh, when I was growing up, I had um, orthotics that uh, included like a specialty shoes, so I couldn't wear anything fancy. I couldn't mm. wear, uh, you know, normal shoes. Right. It had to be the uncomfortable orthotic shoes. And so um, it, it's, you know, awesome that there's these companies coming up. And there's no teenager that wants to wear shoes that look like their grandma wore them, right? Mm. Yeah. And they're not comfortable. No. <laughs> um, yeah, they look as they feel. Yeah, not yeah. Not comfortable at all. And, and like when I was a kid, I, I was small, but I had a size 13 shoe. Not because my feet were big, but oh, it, my braces. My, my braces. Oh. I, I, so like, you look funny. And people always would comment and be like, man, you got big feet. You're like, I know. <laughs> but um, but it, it, it's really amazing, though, as, as, as she was saying. It's like, because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people aren't aware that these things exist. And, and really, it's so important to get this message out and, and to be out, to, to look for these things, because they are there. So what are some things that make clothing adaptable? I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is Velcro. Yeah. Right. Velcro well, instead of buttons is a lot easier to use. What what else is it? Well, I actually uh, have some running shoes that are adaptive uh, shoes, and you don't tie them. You actually use a zipper to fasten them. Oh, okay. Nike put them out because a kid was going off to college, and he said, "I can't tie my own shoelaces because of manual dexterity." I don't want to have to ask my roommate to tie my shoes every day. Right. Nike, what can you do for me? And they created these shoes. Cool. And now I've got a couple of pair of them. They're great. They work really well for me. And a lot of times it depends on the disability. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want to make sure your shoes are on tight when you're running, right? <laughs> you don't want to lose your shoe in the middle of the street. Well, I, yeah. I think, though, Everyone's unique. Sure. Everyone has a different challenge. Everyone, everyone, and, and, and just because you have the same thing doesn't mean that you face the same, same obstacles. Um, so, like one of the big things is independence. Being being disabled or just or just that label of it means that you're not independent. Mm -hmm. And then the perception of oh, I, I I always will have to have this. Well, I'm a big believer in let's 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 make people as independent as possible. How can we how can we provide people the tools to not to, to, to be able to provide for themselves? And working with these groups I've I've talked to them and then came they've some of them come to the realization as dressing yourself. How empowering is it to be able to put your own pants on? To to tie your own shoes, to be able to 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 go and be like I, I got myself dressed, I did this and, and instead of having a nurse, or having your mom, or having a friend, or having your roommate. And, and being able to have really cool or interesting looking clothing, exactly. not to have to wear boring exactly. clothing. And uh, so, so you have, you have zippers. So I, I, a friend of mine, um, his company is called Billy Goat, it's on Zappos Adaptive. But the zippers go all around and up. So, so it just pretty much like encases your foot, and then you can zip it around. And um, or even if you're wearing a big brace. Even if you're example. wearing a big brace, and, and well, then they have somewhere the inside of the shoe has been been removed or in hollow to elongate for room for the braces. Um, but it doesn't look like you're wearing a clown shoe. Doesn't look like you're wearing a clown shoe. Okay. And then you have pants that have magnets on the inside of the button. So, so instead of. Um, so instead of having the buttons, you would have magnets or Velcro or just elastic. Enough elastic though where it's not it's not going to break or look like you're wearing sweatpants. But actually, I have these khakis look just like those yeah. and they're elastic. And, cool. and they're easy slip, they, they fit, they're made where they they have um, channels for your legs so it, so it, it functions. Shirts that instead of like this would look just like this, but on the inside would have but would would have a magnet strip. Oh, that's cool. And you wouldn't even be able to tell that there's a magnet strip there. 
So it, it's little things. Um, it's little things, like you mentioned, Velcro. That's one of the mm -hmm. really cool things about the zippers on the shoe, because shoes that tie with Velcro laces, yeah. they don't look that good. And when you've got the zippers, yeah. they don't look that different than regular shoes. And no. in some ways, they look a little bit better. I, I think so. I have a pair. I, I have, having CP, I'm really picky about like my, my shoes because cause I'm always on my feet. My feet always hurt. And I hate, again, I hate tying my laces. <laughs> I, it, it's kind of, it's, it, it's with fatigue, it just, it's like one of those things that the last thing I want to do is right. tie, some, difficult. tie yeah. some stuff. And um, it's a lot easier to just slip on and off. And this isn't just for people that have CP or whatever, but this is everyone. Because we, we all could be a bit lazy. Certainly. So. Uh, my clothes are all adapted, um, but what I do is mostly is for traveling. So I'll, my mother sewed some big pockets on the front of my shins so I could put my camera or wallet, passport, pills in those pockets. So when I get separated from my chair, go paragliding, skydiving, or or parasailing or, or whatever, I'll always have it on my person, no matter where my chair is. And hats too. Like I had one tailored so the brim was nice and short. Because always, I'm looking up at people all the time and if I have a long brim, I can't, can't yeah. see them. Well, and, and that's something that's a testament to testing. Testing, you, you learn that these are what I need to make it functional. And for a long time, people that were making adaptive clothing don't use them. And they're like, oh, that's, oh, this is, we, we just slap a bunch of Velcro on it and throw some zippers and some magnets and call it a day. And it's like, no, what, what is actually functional? For so long, you've had so many just able-bodied individuals pioneer the, pioneering this world. And now, because of, of mass media and because of this, this, this element of empowering, you're actually getting people that that know what works, that knows that, that for sure knows what doesn't work, <laughs> and and that they're they're promoting it, and that there's a community rallying behind it, and that's what that's what's really amazing to see is that headway. And yeah, maybe did you have anything yeah. you wanted to add? Um, to the what, yeah, I'm so what glad. What works for you? Oh, I'm glad this is happening. Like I said, I had no idea that this was out there, and I wish I had, you know, known about it sooner, or I guess it just started three years Three, four. it's very new, I'm thinking maybe three, maybe five years ago. I haven't they thought it was sooner. I've been fashionable all our lives. <laughs> <laughs> At least we have the hats to prove it, right? <laughs> well, it takes me forever to get missed. That's not even what they're actually making. And we all know it's not cheap having having anything or dealing with anything in life. So just imagine they're already, that's what they're missing. What, what are they making and why can't they use that to put it back into the community? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, there's a lot of things to be really useful though that we don't know about because when some of us post pictures wearing adaptive clothing, we don't mention no. what we're wearing, even though it might be useful to a lot of other folks. We're more interested in the scenery or the culture and the place where we're at. But yeah, I'm, I'm excited now to check out Zappos Adaptive myself. I haven't been there yet, but I'm definitely going there. Um, I'll probably find something that I didn't know existed that, that I need. Yeah. <laughs> Not just one, but that I need, right? Well, and that's, that's a big facet of anything in life is, is everyone has, has wants and everyone has needs. And usually we, we fulfill our wants. And we want we wanted to look cool. We wanted to have these things. We wanted to do this, but 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 we need it to be functional. We need it to, to have that functionality. And and sometimes we're willing to sacrifice being functional versus having that 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 flair. Mm -hmm. And and it's 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 almost twenty twenty. It's time to have both. <laughs> yeah. David and I are nothing if not fashionable. <laughs> I, I can tell. I I I I I saw you when we walked out. I was like, man, that dude's got style. <laughs>
Yeah. So what what other projects have you done since Breaking Bad? I mean, um, you've been in a few films, right? Yeah, I, I, I shoot about three movies a year. Uh, more smaller independent stuff, kind of more avant-garde-esque. Um, I was on a show called Switch to Birth. I did that for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I did another show called Now Apocalypse. Um, and, and just keep working. I, I think the biggest... The biggest thing in, in, in working in our fields and in working in the community is is working. Just, right. Just keep moving forward, keep pushing forward, and, and enjoy what what we're doing. Enjoy what what's happening, and and be aware. And um and, and it's been a great week. It's been a busy week. Um, I'm very excited to be hosting tonight, and uh, and and tomorrow. And if people can't make it this year, come to next year. Um, this will not be going anywhere, but the organization, though, um, uh, CTD is is very active through through the whole year, in in every aspect of of our community, serving um, champion for disability rights. Very very much yeah. so, and, and making a big difference, and making headway. And anyone that's that's been to Capitol Hill or spoke to some congressmen or senators know that it's very <laughs> difficult to get. To get headway, but uh, but but they're changing policy and and it's changing. Will you where can we get more information on the CTD, the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, or the Film Fest? TXDisabilities.org is our website, and you can find the information about the film festival there, or you can use that shortcut of CTDFilmFest.org. That will tell you just about the film festival. And your cell number they can call in case they have complaints? No, you can't call my cell number if they have complaints. They can call your number if they've got complaints. Yeah, and all the links for this show um, will be available in our, on our website at thegeneanddaveshow.com. So I welcome you to go to that site. You're probably already there because you're watching this there. But if you're watching it from YouTube, uh, go to thegeneanddaveshow.com and we'll, we'll explain and put some links in so you can just click them and go on. So thank you all so much for, oh, for being here today. Good. Really appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. And i got to go check out Zappos Adaptive. Do it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. So long, folks. See you all. We interviewed William Greer, the man responsible for CTD, Cinema Touching Disability. William talks about what he has recently learned about disability and shares his thoughts on accessible fashion for people with disabilities. In addition to directing and producing CTD's Cinema Touching Disability, William is an avid marathon runner. He is legally blind. William, well, we've uh, just enjoyed another CTD film fest that you put on. This was, what, number 16 in your career? 16th. Wow, yeah. that's fantastic. And you had quite a variety for us as well this year. How, how do you feel it went? I think it went very well. Um, and the audience loved it. I was glad to see how much they enjoyed it. And uh, they enjoyed some things more than I thought they would. Yeah. So. There, there were some things confusing to me, like that one animation with the salt shaker. And, uh, uh, well, that one was made by people with uh, autism. It was all animated oh. by people with disabilities. And there were three of them that were sent our way. And I loved the one with the salt shaker because of all of the jokes and the sort of silly, corny things that were said. Uh, we had a discussion. We were trying to decide if that was put on by CTD or Alamo Draft House. No, it was uh, made by a group out of the state. Yeah, you've got uh, entries from all over the world. Um, that's fantastic. 30 or so nations. This 30 year. or so nations, that's incredible. So you've been growing over the years, the past 16 years. What, what have you learned over that time? I learned something new about disability every year. Really? And you've worked in the field for so many years. Too. Yes, but I mean, I frequently discover a new disability, one way or another. Uh -huh. um, Years ago, five, six years ago, I learned how serious stuttering is as a disability. Oh, I never, yeah. And there are people who literally have a very hard time speaking because of their stutter, and they have to, I mean, there was someone who said that 
even when it's hot, he orders hot coffee because he can say that. But he can't uh, say iced coffee. Oh my goodness, I never... And it pointed out that a lot of um, cartoons, like, um, oh, um, like on Bugs Bunny with, um, like the hunter who sort of stutters and has a funny way of yeah, speaking. Yeah, yeah, Elmer Fudd. Elmer Fudd. That is a really anti-disability character. And they talk about, I think, also Daffy Duck with the way that he speaks, being anti-stuttering. I had never considered that before. Um, this year, disability fashion was a really big thing for me because I'd never seen how big that industry is and how much it's growing and how people are recognizing it. So th this was really a, a change in format, wasn't it, William? Yes, it was. I mean, this was... We'd never had a fashion show, and we thought, why not introduce a catwalk and have people create adaptive fashion, talk about it, show what it looks like, and show how it's designed, one way or another. And the most innovative design, I thought, was... Um, by the person who's totally blind. And she wanted to put identifiers on her clothing so she could tell what it was. And the person who designed it gave it a little bit of bling. So like she had one that was designed by a butterfly and it put the beads in there so she could not only tell what it looked like, but it looked really cool for her. <laughs> I've been modifying clothes since, since uh, I became disabled. But that was to say shorten sleeves or, or put big old pockets on my pants so when I go traveling I never get separated from my passport and camera and pills and such. And I mean, I use sort of a form, it's not really adaptive fashion, but I make sure that all of my socks are the same color so that I don't have one blue sock and one black sock. Well, they're all the same color, pretty easy to tell. Yeah, yeah. And, um... Nothing that, nothing that huge, but I make little adjustments one way or another, but I'd never thought of clothing, you know, adapting right. all of the clothing to meet needs. William, have you got any spoiler alerts for us for next year? And but will you let the Gina Dean show know first? Oh, I definitely, I definitely will, and sometimes you don't know until it pops up. One year, there were two movies about really powerful women with disabilities. Um, Lizzie Velasquez, very underweight person, no fat on her body. And she had to deal with a lot of bullying, so she had an anti-bullying uh, video. And then there was a movie about a pilot, a lady who's a pilot, and she has uh, no arms, so she's the only armless pilot. So, there we had... Um, strong women with disabilities and you know one year we had um, prosthetics including animals with prosthetic limbs and that just came about totally by chance so sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it pops up at unexpected times so we'll see what kind of applicants you get for next year definitely and um I might have some really good ideas after the South by Southwest Film Festival because that's when we found uh, a lot of really cool films. On this episode of the Gene and Dave Show, we join CTD staff member Jennifer Bracey, who tells us how it came to be the CTD Cinema Touching Disability included an additional segment on accessible fashion for people with disabilities. We're here today with Jennifer as part of the CTD. Film Fest, and Jennifer, uh, I was talking with William, he was saying this year you did something different. You had a fashion segment uh, to the CTD Film Fest. How did that come about, and, and what role do you play? So, um, last year after our festival, you know, every year like we take a week off after our festival, and then we kind of start thinking about the next year and what we might want to do. And William had been seeing all of these uh, things online about adaptive fashion and disability styling. 
and he was like, you know what, I just really want to focus on this and make a statement about uh, adaptive fashion, and so I was like, well, okay, you know, how do you, how do you want to do that? Like, I think that's a great idea. And he said, you know, I've, I've really heard a lot about Mindy Shire from w Runway of Dreams, and uh, she has a son with a disability, and, and she started creating clothing for him, and, and she has this whole thing going in New Jersey, and so um, we reached out to her, connected with her, and uh, started learning more and more about it, and we were just like, this is it, this is what we need to do, and then... Um, RJ Mitty had been working with Mindy and you know I was like it would be great if we could reach out to Mindy again get RJ's contact information and have him come to the festival this year and host it given his advocacy work and uh, his work in media and his fashion uh, fashion work and so uh, it was a natural fit. They got back to us very quickly, and uh, he was happy to come. And it was it was great this year. And, and let me interrupt you here. Uh, R. J. Mitty is uh, co-star on Breaking Bad. Yes. So he is not the easiest person to get a hold of. Definitely not the easiest person to get a hold of. However, it felt like it was very easy this go round. I mean, she got back to us. His publicist got back to us. Uh, within a few hours of us asking like hey can he come and so we really felt like it was a meant to be situation and we couldn't be happier to have him so it was so great having him and uh, and then this whole fashion challenge idea came together I really couldn't tell you how it just started and we were like you know if we're gonna talk about adaptive fashion like we should really reach out to our members and and see what their clothing issues are and how we might be able to help them. And so then it just turned into this whole conversation that was just incredible. And myself being a filmmaker first, I was like, we have to film this. Like, I, I need to follow their stories. And so we selected five people from our community. Uh, to pair them with four designers, um, both in Austin and uh, our maker, Ison Chawson, from uh, the Houston Galveston area. So. Well, that's incredible. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see what happens next year. Thank you. Yes, it's. Uh, it, we'll see. You know, I don't. I don't really know. We kind of just pay attention to the trends that are happening mm -hmm. in our community and. And, you know, it's all about listening to our members and what you guys want to see. We want to bring you uh, the media representation that you feel uh, you would like and uh, how we can all connect. It's really about continuing conversations and, you know, if there's any time that we can do any sort of legislative change or anything like that, you know, to get things moving on an advocacy level, uh, that's what we're all about, so accurate representation in the media for people with disabilities and changing the picture of film uh, through disability so, representation. So Jennifer, if people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to contact you? Instagram, uh, they can Instagram me at jinja, J-E-N-J-A -E underscore B. Uh, I'm always on Instagram. They can also Instagram me at CTD Film Fest and uh, also find me online at our social media page, uh, Cinema Touching Disability Film Fest, and also my email. I'm yeah, I'm all over, but in, in your email, my email is J Bracy B as in boy R A C Y at txdisabilities.org. Fantastic. Yeah. So folks. Reach out to Jennifer. She's got a lot of information. Yeah. And uh, she certainly wants to hear what, what you want to see as well. Yeah, I want to I wanna continue the film moving forward. And I want to, you know, again, tap into what you guys want to see and what I can do for you and, and how we can keep the conversation going moving forward because there is, you know, a real epicenter uh, to all this that is really coming together. And I think with all of us banding together... Um, both in terms of fashion and legislative change, uh, we can really do something great together. So, Fantastic.
Thank you so much, Gene. Thank you. Thank you. So long, folks. Bye. We join Adaptive Fashion Challenge participants for an in-depth panel discussion on the adaptive fashion movement, plus how designers and individuals with disabilities can work together to solve fashion problems. Yeah, like I said last night, I actually started this process about 27 years ago, and I was in college, and that's when I discovered, you know, the need for clothing for people with disabilities as a real issue that there were brands out there, at the time there were still catalogs. And so there were brands out there that were definitely like Sears for uniforms, you know, standard Velcro or hook and loop, that's the, uh, I give them their copyright. But um, there were definite brands out there, but it wasn't about fashion, it was just simply about function. I think Jason Penney also had uniforms, you had brands like Silverts, which is still around. Um, they're based in Toronto. You had brands, uh, a lot of brands overseas, interestingly enough. Um, the States was really slow to the game with regards to adaptive fashion. And I think what that did for me is it created an insatiable desire to research. But it wasn't research to get a PhD. It wasn't research to start a business. I was literally just out to solve a problem. And that's a different type of motivation. And so what would happen is anyone that I saw on the street with assistive technology, like I was saying, occupational therapist, any, any doctor I could talk to, any one that I could talk to, I gained information. And then from there, I went on to, I was actually shopping in Target. And Target now has an adaptive collection for children. And it's only two women running that, two women. And they're not getting a lot of support because, but that's what happens. A woman has a child with a disability and she says, I want to make sure there's access. And so now you have something at Target. But I went into Target at the time shopping for something for my cat who allowed me to live in our home. Um, so I needed, to bring, I needed to bring a toy home. And I saw clothing for dogs that was just, it looked like a London fall coat. And we see them all the time. The, the pockets were, the zippers. I'm like, what is a dog going to use the pocket? You know? <laughs> and then it just, at that point, I packed away all of my clothes for an entire year. I was still on radio, on the radio in the morning. I had a morning drive show. And I packed away all of my clothing. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to raise awareness for the next year. And at the end of that year, that's actually when I started, you know, the first time in my life I actually gained weight. I became less social. Um, my self efficacy was in the trash. It was just weird going into a store and only being able to pick from a random number of pajamas when all of this clothing was available. And I thought, this is how people feel when they don't have access and choice. And so that's what really motivated me to go back to get a second grad degree in fashion journalism and really, you know, make a difference. My path started with just needing a chance to kind of have an alternative to stress. I was working in a Pezzavec tech in a nonprofit animal clinic, and we dealt with a lot of surgeries and emergencies, 15 hour days for seven years I did that. And I and my husband recognized that, so we started talking about like, I could never find things in stores that I liked because I have a particular like idea of what I like to wear. So he was like, well, make them, because I keep my clothes. I have clothes from high school, from the 90s. I mean, I keep my clothes. <laughs> and so he and I talked about it, and I started sewing. And then within a year, I took a bunch of classes, taught myself a bunch of stuff, started researching. And then within a year and a half, we started the business. And now, that's I do that full time. It supports, um, you know, pays our bills. I do it 100% of the time. And it's taken me on such a great, journey, but you were saying, my path is completely different. Yeah. I mean, I was working full-time, getting up at 5 or 6 in the morning, working on sewing, learning drafting, reading books till about 9 o'clock, then I'd go to work, come home at 6, do it again until midnight or 1, every day. Because I was super into it. I was super passionate about it, and I didn't know. And I offer instruction as well through my business because I've been a teacher more than half my life, but I tell my students, regardless of your age, just do it. Yeah. You might like it, you might love it, you might hate it, but at least you'll know. I didn't have any exposure to sewing as a kid, and it wasn't the child who had the grandmother sewing and had the tin box of cookies with sewing. I didn't grow up with any of that. 
and I didn't know that I was going to be good at it. So that led me down that road, and then we just decided to start the business. We started small, and then we realized it was that we had a demand, and then we found a target market, and, and we researched a lot. My husband and I researched a lot. We were constantly working, and when we're on vacation, we're still brainstorming. When we're eating lunch, we're brainstorming. We're just constantly on it because we're passionate about it. And so I think that's important, is finding something that you really want to focus on, you're really passionate about, try new things, just everything, just try it. And if you, you know, you're in an Austin, we're in a city where you have accessibility to a lot of things, you know, where I'm from, I didn't. So I just think that's a big part of it, is just giving everything a chance and seeing what you're good at. And then I started doing custom sewing, and then I started, you know, dabbling in instruction. So now um, I run a sewing and design studio. I offer instruction, product development, design work, and custom sewing. So customers are actually able to find us because of the help of my husband. He is a marketing specialist. So well, I'm very fortunate. He and I work very well together. And um, so luckily, we've again researched on how to, you know, the SEO and how to do the whole, I'm not going to really go into detail because I don't know much about it, but we researched a lot on how to find customers and also I am the kind of person that will get out there. Like somebody asked me to do this like CTD, I have no exposure to this program or the organization. I was like, sure. Somebody will ask me to do something, I always say yes, almost always, yeah. because I never know who I'm going to meet and how it's going to change my experience. So. But I think it's important, I agree with everything you just said, it's important to also solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Like you can't just be, you know, how can I get my stuff out there? It's got to be, and I don't care what the industry is. I think the most effective entrepreneurs are people that identify a problem and solve it. Mm -hmm. And then everyone goes, why did I do that? I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of Spanx. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> because they cut the bottom of their stockings off. Like if you've ever done something like that, she did it and thought, huh. Now she has stores, and it's just solving a problem. And I think when you go into something from the mindset that I'm going to solve a problem, it helps you identify your customer base because you are meeting a need. So you're not forcing them to you know, jump on board on your ideas. You're saying, I see you, you matter, and I'm going to help meet your need. So Stephanie, um, where do you see opportunities to bridge the divide between big brand adaptive fashion and DIY, you know, how we're all kind of doing it ourselves for now. Well, I think the I think the the bridge is communication. As a communication professor, I think that that's the bridge. I think having the courage to get for people that are doing this on their own, you have to be able to have what it takes to just contact the brands and say, hey, you know, it costs it, it costs a lot of money to take a small brand and manufacture because your orders are small, increases the price, but these larger guys can do that portion. You need to present yourself as a consultant. You need to say, like I saw that you were working with, um, that you're working with AFOs. You know, I would follow all L's and follow those other brands and see how they're doing their thing with prosthetics. And then I would, you know, just chatting with people and seeing if they want to. I was looking at a sports like shin guards because mm -hmm. Adidas and yeah, you know those huge brands, yeah. yeah. And uh, actually, we went to Carol's Orthotist, which I had, you know, I did a lot of research on patents and seeing what was out there on what was already like um, not under patent anymore because yeah. it's over 20 years. And I saw a lot of these designs and kind of made an adaption and like little prototypes on how she could not sweat in them so much because yeah. that's the biggest problem. I'm sure you know. Yeah. <laughs> and she's saying, you know, I sweat in the in the winter, I sweat in the summer, and it's always miserable. I mean, we've all had sweaty feet at some point, so we know how this feels. Um, and we just kind of got into a conversation when Jennifer was there that was kind of disheartening because it instead of being about like new ideas and how we can solve the problem, it directly went into Medicare and Medicaid and how they won't pay for new stuff and you know, they have to so he said like 
something new needs to be paid for by 2,000 people before they even consider um, you know, adopting it, which could be, for something simple, couldn't be that bad because you, know, you could charge, I don't know, 50 bucks or something, and how much are shin guards? You know, and you see this disconnect between shin guards versus AFOs and why are they so expensive? I guess it's the custom part. And I think too, it's not just the custom part, it's because we're segregated as a community. So disability doesn't have the political power, doesn't have a lot of power to be, do you think any other group would allow that disparity in pricing? No way. No way, they'd lobby, and I, I've trained as a lobby um, mm -hmm. in the program that they've had in different states, but I, I got advocacy training and I thought, there would never be this problem, but this group needs the money for their, their issue. This group needs the money for their issue. Yeah. So it keeps it segregated, and that's where we lose the power, the one voice power. So she, he was talking about replacing straps used to be free, you know, like the Velcro straps. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Carol said it last night. You, you need to wait five years to get a new pair of clothes. So imagine the same shoes for five years. That sounds crazy, but, you know, that's how it is. Yeah. So straps are gonna break. Yeah. He used to replace them for free, and now he has to charge two hundred dollars for these Velcro. So he told me, "Well, you can do whatever you want." Obviously, I'm working with a hospital, so at the moment, I don't want to like do whatever I want because I carry the liability of a big institution. But as a friend, you know, I'm like, "Yeah, maybe I can help you for free, or like you buy the ten bucks worth of Velcro." Or but I feel like this is a global problem in America, period, when it comes to any assistive device. To get a wheelchair, um, you know, it's like you have to have your own army to prove to the insurance companies that you need it. You know, and I mean, we're talking not even the latest and greatest, we're talking just a lightweight wheelchair. And you do have to wait five to seven years to get anything. And a lot of times you can't you can't just rely on the insurance company. You also have to uh, pursue other state services and prove to them that you are worthy. Because the fact that we're even you know I'm here from LA having this conversation means that things are changing. I couldn't pay anyone to have me talk about this a decade ago. <laughs> You're like, no, keep your money. I'm just uh, no. so the fact that people want to know and are having this. Conversation, I think shows you. So it's not that the brands are necessarily leaving it, they really don't know. Yeah. I, I want to say something else before we move on. There's a lot of talk on Twitter about ableism. Have you guys heard the term ableism? Yes. Have you, has anyone, is anyone unfamiliar with the term ableism? So ableism just means people that discriminate against people with disabilities because you're able bodied. So my thing is, can we really have a conversation about ableism before we authentically discuss disability? And my answer is no. You know, because I think, when do we learn about disability? What class? What class did we take? Was it social studies, math? You know, did we, you know, when did we learn about disabilities? Did we learn about the history, the civil rights, the language? Until we realize that there's been a gap in communication and knowledge we can't accuse people of ableism because we are still afraid to say disability. And I don't mean how we self-identify. Every single person gets to self-identify however they want. That's the power of it. But as a culture, when is it taught? We celebrate Columbus Day, but we don't know anything about disability. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So the work that I do with individuals is personal styling. So yes, it is personal lives to that particular person's lifestyle and body type. But my styling system, I use it across the board. I, I have these three questions that I ask, and all those simple when I say them, if you've ever shopped for something and you walk up to it and you think it's really nice and it's cute, you're like, oh, I love this. If it doesn't get those three checks, we leave it in the store. We leave it online. So it has to be accessible. It has to be easy to put on and take off for your body type. And you know, I remember when I first got this trademarked, they weren't gonna let me call it disability fashion styling system because they were like, 
everyone's going to use the word disability. I finally was able to get my lawyer to, to get around that. But um, it's accessible. It has to be accessible, easy to put on and take off. It has to be smart, smart for your health. And what I mean by that is that if you're a little woman and you're wearing shoes that are going to, you know, cause you, that are just dangerous, you know. Most little women that I know, even if I'm putting them in heels, a slight heel, it's never going to be like a stiletto. It's going to be something that works with their body type that's good for their health. So it has to be smart. And then finally, it has to be fashionable. It has to work not only for their body type, but, you know, for their lifestyle. And body types mean like if you have, happen to have a seated body type, we all know some people use wheelchairs and they also stand. We also know some people use wheelchairs and they have spinal cord injuries. You know, everyone that uses a wheelchair doesn't have the same problem. So it needs to work for their lifestyle, their body type, and then you have to love it. And once we check those three boxes, then it's good to go. What normally happens is they love it and then it has a zipper in the back if they're wheelchair users and I'm like, there's no way you'll be able to get out of this if I'm not around, no. And they're like, don't worry about it, I'll have someone there. And that's usually the fight because it's very difficult to find brands that are not, you know, zippers in the back or all these fasteners or inset sleeves that make it difficult to put on and, you know, even something jersey knit like this is something that I would suggest mm -hmm. because it has an inset sleeve, it has the current trend of a puffy, you know, a puffy sleeve, and it is a midi which works well with a long boot, a booty, different ways that they can dress it up. They can add a belt, they can, we can play with it. So I try to get them to rethink their clothing so that they can have things that they need. And this is for my male customers as well as my female customers and my non-binary gender you know, customers. I just try to make sure that I'm listening and I'm helping to meet their needs. This program was made possible from the support of VSA Texas. Mom afford to have help preparing her meals? We know what you're going through. Amerigroup has a plan for people with Medicaid that helps them get the services they need to live at home. Amerigroup, choose us for helping your loved ones live at home. Call 1-800-964-2777.